a dream of soul, country, of cosmic, what I call cosmic American music. Want to scratch my itch, sweet Annie Rich, and welcome me back to You can touch a core in people. We call it high lonesome, and it's a certain melancholy, and it's a, it's a sort of beautiful pain. <laughs> But he had that to the max. Very little is really known about him considering how much has been written about him. I mean, he was kind of a mysterious guy. It adds up to kind of a legend. Any accolade I've been paid in any kind of acknowledgement of my success is an acknowledgement of Graham Parsons. But that won't keep you warm at night. If he had lived, Today, I think he would be a very big star. Graham was rock and country. He bridged those two worlds. Just see him standing in the middle of these two worlds, you know, bringing them together, uniting them, you know. And that was his purpose. He was very alive, you know, a lovely guy. He just had this dark side and really sort of a death wish. Graham considered himself the fallen angel. I said, if Graham was here today, he'd still be dead. He was heading in that direction. He was really a victim of the times. He wasn't doing anything anybody else wasn't doing. It just, he just didn't have the constitution that uh, it took to be a rock and roller. In that respect, he was definitely more the country boy. It's a story that is so extraordinary. I mean, Graham's life and his death is something that might be in a movie, but you don't think of it actually happening in real life that way. Our family background, even with slight pieces of truth in it, is an intense background. It's a series of tragedies. It's like a, the Kennedy curse. We're talking about a very classic Tennessee Williams uh, play here, uh, Southern money and, and uh, alcoholism, and, and just a tragedy. They were one of the pioneer families in Winter Haven. They were probably the biggest citrus people in the world, and probably uh, the wealthiest. And so they were the royal family of Winter Haven, and uh, with lots of money. Graham's mother, Avis, was well aware that she was a Snively. She married Coon Dog Connor, a World War II hero from Tennessee, whose primary pleasures were hunting and fishing. And there's a picture of Coon Dog in here, which was Graham's dad. And he was uh, a war veteran. Uh, I think uh, Graham got a lot of his uh, storytelling from uh, Coon Dog, because I hear he was uh, quite a character, just a, a really great guy. They sent him to Georgia to build the fruit boxes. And so he went up there and ran the plant. You know, when he was given this deal and sent up here, uh, you know, this is. Uh, this kind of place could drag you down after a few years. Then you got the Snivelys on top of him and always letting him know they had the money, not him. He was always letting on that. He, lots of times during the day, he would bring his son out there. Graham, Graham was a real knowledgeable fellow around that. He said, you know, one day I might own all this. I said, yeah, I said, that's why I'm treating you so good. <laughs> Early on, there were rumors that Graham's parents had problems with alcohol. They led rakish, unchallenging lives as heirs to the Snively fortune in the provincial town of Waycross. Despite his parents' marital problems, Graham got a baby sister, little Avis, named after her mother. You see the front stoop there? The front stoop is uh, where Graham used to perform to the neighborhood kids. He would stand on the stoop, and I think he had Avis in his band too, sort of, and he frowned on the guitar and, and did Elvis imitations. This was after the City Auditorium event, I think. When Graham was 10 years old, it would have been 1957. Here was his first really rock and roll influence, was this building here, watching Elvis Presley. And he got to meet Elvis after the show, as history says. They say that it changed his life to the point the next day he was a different kid. Train, train. Run, run, 
On December the 22nd, 1958, Coon Dog brought Graham, his mother Avis and sister Little Avis to the train station to send them to Winter Haven for a Christmas vacation at the Snively Mansion. Coon Dog went home and shot himself the next day. Graham was 12 years old. A few days after Coon Dog's funeral, Graham, his mother and his sister moved to the Snively estate in Winterhaven for good. After a short while, a new man would enter their lives. Bob Parsons was from New Orleans and he came to visit and he met Avis Snively and they fell in love and got married. All the Snivelys never liked Bob because they felt that he had married Avis for her money. Graham was a lost kid and then when Bob married Avis, Bob sort of took him under his wing and I think a large part of his psychological success was because of Bob and uh, Graham just adored Bob. He lived very comfortably on Graham's mother's money but I think that he loved Graham and Avis and felt that they were his children and he did adopt them which is why they have his name. Avis was a really a hopeless alcoholic long before she died and I don't think Bob knew how much she drank. But Bob Parsons was a drinker himself and young Graham spent more and more time at the home of his new friend Jim Carlton. Together they formed a high school band, The Legends. He was used to nice things and uh, you know he always had better clothes than anybody else. Just hot clothes. Where did you get those clothes Graham? And he was always rather enigmatic about it. We were a meat and potatoes rock and roll band. Graham would sing whatever standards were accessible to someone who only knew a few chords. Even back then, he knew what he wanted to do. He wanted to be a celebrity more than anything else, I think. Perhaps that was, had something to do with his privileged upbringing. His stepdad and mom had bought him a club to perform in when he was 16, and that's, boy, that's something. At this time, a new member of the Parsons family arrived. I was too little to remember the home in Winter Haven um, with all the musical equipment and the dairy down, but a lot of what they did was to promote Graham and his music. And we had, you know, the piano, and we literally had what was called the music room downstairs, and the piano wasn't far from it. You know, that was all for Graham. This photograph is of Graham in his sophomore year at Winter Haven High School, 1962. I have a couple of uh, inscriptions from Graham. Perhaps someday we'll both find out what we want. If so, we can't help but get it. In the meantime, we must suck knowledge like cyanide from an old peach pet, see you in the playground of the stars. Until then, sound as ever, Graham. By this time, Graham was at a prep school called Bowles in Jacksonville. He was a charismatic guy when we were kids. A lot of us knew that Graham was probably going to wind up having some kind of a career or some kind of success. He just exuded it and he was driven. He sort of stuck out from the pack even then, you know. Oh, he was so pretty. He wore his hair a little bit longer than boys did then. And they were perfect manners. I mean, and just so sure of himself. I mean, when he told me, he was going to be a rock star. When he told me he was going to be like Elvis Presley, I saw no reason to disbelieve him. He got me in a couple of fights. He was one of those characters that get in a room with or a bar room or somewhere and get some people riled up and then step back and watch the, watch the trouble start. <laughs> he didn't mind playing with your mind and telling some lies maybe once in a while and things like that. I have recollection of him going off for weekends and doing shows when we were there. He was involved in a group called the Shilohs. And when he met us, he, he knew a lot of folk music. He loved Josh White. He loved uh, Fred Neal. Uh, he loved uh, Kingston Trio, all these groups like this. Graham, you could tell, had a different kind of upbringing. He said, you're a musician. He said, uh, you don't have to worry about what other people think. He said, you're different. You're different than they are. He said, you can do a lot more with your hair. Grow your hair out. Don't have that short hair. And all of a sudden, there was no doubt we were going to make it. 
with spices and parsley. Miss Parsons drank, but but she used to come whenever we'd play if she was around. My heart was filled with pride. She was very supportive of Graham's career. She loved Graham very much. You could tell the love that she had for him. One morning in June 1965, Graham got the news that his mother had died of an alcohol-related disease at Winter Haven Hospital. That was around the time Graham graduated from Bowles. Rumours soon spread that Bob Parsons had supplied Avis with the drink that killed her. On his last visit, uh, after he left the room, almost immediately, she died. And I think hence the, the rumour that uh, circulated that Bob had done something to her. And uh, I think that's pure fiction of, of, of the highest order. Whatever relationship he had with Avis was, um, he wouldn't have killed her. I mean, he wouldn't have, um, he wouldn't have done that to basically their children he adopted. In the early morning rain. Graham left both his school and his band behind him and moved north for a new start at Harvard University. It was clear to me from the start that going to Harvard University wasn't the primary reason that Graham was there. And getting admitted to Harvard and coming to Cambridge got Graham out of the South and somewhere else and put him in a position where he could pursue his real interest, which was music. When Graham arrived at Harvard, he immediately looked for players to form a band. One like-minded musician was guitarist John Nuis. At the time I met him, during the summer of 1965, and he was playing strictly folk music. We played um, some folk music, we played country music, and I, at that time, I told him about um, Merle Haggard. In the corner, and, I said, and he loved it. He couldn't believe it. He would eat a lot. He said, this is great. This is great stuff. I say, little old. I told him about these country singers, Buck Owens. He really liked Buck Owens. And it starts a jumping every evening when the sun goes down. That is really sort of uh, essentially musically some of the uh, primary and initial music ingredients that started the whole thing. That's a shimmy, shake he would spend almost every evening at some time or another in my apartment right next door. He'd get very depressed and he would come to my room and be especially worried about Avis, his younger sister, who was sort of all by herself down there in the south. And we spent a lot of time talking about that. And he was probably the real family that she had left. Now Graham and Avis had lost both parents in tragic circumstances. Avis still lived in Winterhaven with her stepfather and her half-sister, Diane. Shortly after her mother's death, Bob Parsons married Diane's 18-year-old babysitter, Bonnie. He was a philanderer, you know. He was guilty of a lot of things, but he wasn't guilty of neglecting um, Graham and Avis. By the end of that semester, Graham had failed every course primarily because he didn't go to any of them, or very seldom went to the classes. I recommended that Graham be dismissed, which I had to do, you know, because he flunked everything. Graham and John Nuis moved to New York and founded the International Submarine Band with their friend Ian Dunlop on bass and R&B fan Mickey Galvin on drums. Graham rented a house that the band could share while they developed their mixture of rock and roll, R&B, and country music. He found a house for rent, a duplex house, in the Bronx. This is where we started to rehearse and so on and so forth and played. There must be something. The International Submarine Band recorded a few songs and released two singles, which didn't sell. A few months later, Graham traveled to Los Angeles, where some friends introduced him to the inner circle of the L.A. rock scene. One night, Graham was invited to a party at David Crosby's house. Crosby was a member of the Birds. Graham also met Crosby's girlfriend, Nancy Lee Ross. From what I understand, my mother was engaged to David Crosby, and she still to this day says that she loved him very, very much. And uh, Dad came on the scene and walked up to her and said, I've been looking for you for a long time, and I'm taking you with me. Graham moved the International Submarine Band to California, and Nancy was soon pregnant with Graham's daughter, Polly. 
With a new ISB lineup, Graham and John Nuis continue to work on their vision of crossing rock with country. We got the record deal with LHI Records for the International Submarine Band album, Safe at Home. Safe at Home was probably the first country rock album, but it was a commercial flop. Graham's days in the ISB would soon be over. I did run into this fella Graham at a uh, bank in Beverly Hills. I was in line and he comes in, this bubbly young kid, and uh, I said, I know your name, I've heard about you. And we talked and I said, you know, um, we're uh, looking for some other players in the birds right now. We're gonna rehearse tonight. If you'd like to come down and sit in with us and see what happens. I started in the Birds and as the shy bass player, and if anybody watches the old Birds videos, I'm the guy in the back row next to Mike Clark, the drummer. Oh, Having come through 1965, and, and here was the five original Birds and, and achieving monumental worldwide success and uh, meeting the Beatles and et cetera, and going through all this. Graham came down, and what really clinched the deal for me was at the end of that rehearsal, he picks up a guitar and he starts singing Under Your Spell Again, Buck Owens. And I sang harmony to him and I went, wow, I have a guy here who understands what this kind of music is. And so uh, I sort of said to Roger McGuinn, I said, I think we should hire this guy. Graham came in with such a strong love of country music and, and that's where we made the decision to go to Nashville and cut Sweetheart of the Rodeo. Graham had some really good ones. Two of his best songs, Hickory Wind, 100 Years From Now, two of the best songs I think he ever wrote. So, and he had so much enthusiasm that he got to uh, the two old battle-weary veterans off their feet and give us a little boot in the rear. Through the sweetheart of the rodeo experience, it opened up so many people to what country music was or could be and erased a lot of that negative stigma that a lot of people carried around about it. I bought Sweetheart of the Rodeo. I took it home and went, hey, this is a country record. What's going on here? Graham was a, quite a good performer then. Once again, he was focused, he was disciplined, he was working hard. He was adding a lot to what we were doing at that time. When we gave him free reign, buddy, he took it. He took that free reign and wrote it right out there. So yes, as Roger said, we were hiring a keyboard player, but we got George Jones in a rhinestone suit. In a far away city. At a certain point, we felt maybe we should start reining this horse in because it's getting away from us. I think he was really climbing that ladder, and we were just one of the rungs in the ladder. He was going up. Hey, Mr. Spaceman, won't you please take me along? We got over to England to play with Graham and Doug Dillard on banjo. That's where we got close with Mick Jagger and Keith Richards. And you know, Graham was one of those kind of guys, you know, you meet on occasion. You know, say, um, hey, I've known you forever. Yeah. And then you can only find out more about each other. But it was kind of like that immediately with him and me. And the important thing about that night to me, the first night I met him, was that he starts asking me about South Africa. That's where they were going on from London. They were going to play South Africa. And he says, but I'm starting, I don't know much about this. We were assured we would be playing for mixed audiences. And we were very naive because that certainly wasn't going to happen. Uh, in 1968, apartheid was at its highest. You know. He says, that they pay well. Says, yeah, but, you know, it's, and then I explained, it was, oh, you mean just like Mississippi, huh? <laughs> when that segregation and the sanctions and all that. And that very night, he said, well, I ain't going. You know, I mean, just like that. And I said, well, that's a good I just got you out the van right now. <laughs> you were a member of the birds yesterday. Today you ain't got a gig because I told you. <laughs> so. Obviously, his tenure in the birds was over. We let him go, and we were not happy and Roger McGuinn and I, the consummate professionals, we said, well, we have a contract, we're gonna go to South Africa. You know, we, we'll do this without you. And we did. The tour was a musical and financial disaster, with a roadie taking Graham's place on stage. When it was over, everyone agreed they shouldn't have gone in the first place. However, the reason 
He did not go to South Africa, was not based on a moral dilemma over racism. It was because he wanted to stay and hang out with Keith Richards. And then I started to find out his incredible knowledge of music, country music specifically. You know, since we were obviously, we, we, we hooked right away uh, as friends, that uh, the next thing being musicians, that we started to find out about what we knew about music, what we liked. She's gone, gone, gone. We had a great love for the for Lefty Frizzell, Felice and Boodle O'Brien, for the for the songwriting. We just, uh, a, a lot of times, just like, uh, talk about songwriting and the construction and, the, you know, what a song's supposed to do and how to do it best. Back in L.A., Graham's relationship with Nancy fell apart. He left his young family and got back in touch with former Birds colleague, Chris Hillman. I actually made peace with him. And uh, in a matter of two months, we, we were friends again. We discussed things, and we were discussing future projects. That's when the Burrito Brothers was hatched. In the Flying Burrito Brothers, Parsons and Hillman continued to experiment with country music played with a rock and roll attitude. The Burrito's other founding members were Mississippian Chris Etheridge, whose bass playing brought a strong R&B element to the band, and virtuoso pedal steel guitarist Sneaky Pete Kleino. Ex-Birds drummer Michael Clark would join them a few months later. Graham and I were living together in Reseda, California, sharing a house and seeking solace in each other's friendship and then writing songs and but launching this new band. I think Chris was the best friend, male friend, that Graham ever had, really, and they worked very well together. They were in, in great shape and having a good time. Boy, they wrote a lot of good songs. Uh, during that time. Sin City, for instance, that's a brilliant song in my opinion. Graham was sleeping, I woke up and I had this idea. This old town's filled with sin, it'll swallow you in. I got the first verse and most of the chorus. And then I said, Graham, get up, I got something here. And he got up and we wrote that song in about 30 minutes. It, it actually wrote itself. This old earthquake. The they had great material. They were charming, they looked wonderful. And they had this insane list of demands, you know, that, that Graham wanted, that had to do with trips to England and this, that, and the other, and limos. They wanted to have the full Beatles rock star treatment before they made a record. Gilded Palace of Sin, we recorded at A&M, at the studios at A&M in Hollywood. We all hope that we can still be proud of something 30 years down the road. That's what you're trying to shoot for. And those songs certainly fit the bill on the Gilded Palace of Sin. I didn't have contact with, with other steel players that had a fuzz tone. I've never heard anybody use it in the same way. They're probably going to say, well, we didn't want to. <laughs> I think it produced some gems. I think that album is a wonderful album. I think uh, Graham Parsons bringing in songs like Dark End of the Street, Do Right Woman was a stroke of genius. I really think so. That's where he shone. That's where he takes this very R&B uh, ballads and puts them into a country vein. Well, uh, we was at a rehearsal one day when we was getting ready to do the album, and I told Graham that I had a couple old melodies from back when I was... Uh, growing up and uh, did he want to hear him? He said, yeah, so we went ahead and I played them for him and we wrote the two songs that day, the Hot Burrito 1 and Hot Burrito 2, and then that, that night went to the studio and cut them. You may be sweet and nice, but that won't keep you warm at night. His best song probably he ever wrote was Hot Burrito 1 and his best vocal on record on any recording was Hot Burrito 1. I don't know, he had kind of a soulful, almost help me voice. Like he had a voice that when he would sing, it was almost like uh, he was asking for help or something. It's kind of hard to explain that, you know. Nobody saw. that he had had a bunch of tragedies in his family, so I'm sure that was really hard on him, you know. 
After Bob Parsons moved back to New Orleans with his new wife Bonnie and his two daughters, Graham didn't see them very often. However, the family did stay in touch. Well, I wouldn't call it a pleasure, but I did meet Bob Parsons, and that was Graham's stepfather. He comes to the door looking for Graham and during the burritos, knocks on the door, and I was ready to call Central Casting because here's this guy with the most gaudy uh, plaid sport coat on and white polished shoes. I thought he was going to sell me a Buick or something. Still living with Bob Parsons in New Orleans, Graham's sister Avis became a troubled teenager. She got pregnant and ran away from home to start a new life. Meanwhile, Graham was busy refining the image of the Flying Burrito Brothers. Graham comes up with this brilliant idea, let's go get some nudie suits. And I went, yeah. Nudie Cohn had a store in Hollywood called Nudie's Rodeo Tailors, where he made stage outfits for Elvis Presley and country stars like Hank Williams. Graham and the Burritos introduced these outfits to the hip LA rock scene of the late 60s. Manuel Cuevas worked in Nudie's original store and was in charge of making the burrito suits. The idea of the suits was, since it was a takeoff from country music, and we talked for months uh, working these ideas and how they wanted to look. The best part of the ideas was we opted for our own individual little painting on each suit. Graham's suit, of course, is very famous. We all know that suit. It had every pharmaceutical item in the book on the sleeves in the way of pills and marijuana plants. And, and the two naked women up here was quite a good touch. On the back, he had a cross, almost like uh, either a cross between a, a prison tattoo cross or a cholo cross, uh, you know, a homeboy cross. But interesting, interesting stuff. What he was transferring to me in, in the form of ideas for making the suit was the actual way that he wanted to die, from the flames to the cross, to the marijuana, to the pills, and to the girls. We decided to take him out to the desert and do something kind of surreal with the nudie suit. It was a great idea, the cover. Barry Feinstein shot that. Tom Wilkes, who was the head of the art department at A&M, and Tom and Barry, they did a wonderful job on that cover. You know, it was just a, a mad afternoon of taking pictures that, that we thought were abstract, because everybody was loaded. This old earthquake's yeah, we were out there real early. And uh, we got these gorgeous girls to be models, and it was very cold. And we made the pictures. The girls were running around, and it was it was more of a Felitti moment than an album cover. And they look great anyway. They look funky and kind of country western and kind of rock and. And I felt that look was great. They didn't really need the nudie suits. Tom Wilkes wanted something with them with a Joshua tree behind them. He wanted to use that place as the Gilded Palace of Sin. This old they all liked it. Everybody there knew we were in the right place. It seems like this whole but there's an attitude on that cover. It's one of my favorite album covers ever. The burrito stuff was, you know, on the 31st floor. I know some of his songs were starting to really intrigue me. Uh... Back in Los Angeles, Buffalo Springfield had experimented with country elements, as had Poco. However, the Flying Burrito Brothers probably had the most radical approach, both in their music and in their image. The Burritos had begun playing the local club circuit, trying to build up a fan base. Miss Mercy and Miss Pamela of the all-girl band The GTOs were among their first fans and saw almost every show. 
sometimes Mercy and I, and maybe six or eight other people were the only people in the room. They were not a popular band. Yeah, they looked great, and they sounded horrific. They were just terrible. I thought, this is a band who, it's all about image, and they never rehearse, clearly. I mean, they don't, they don't have a plan, they, they, you know, they don't have harmonies at work. I mean, it just sounded like a train wreck. And if you do a bad show and you got a rhinestone suit on, boy, getting off the stage is tough. You know, you're shining like a, mm-mm, not good. But the heart was there, the spirit was there. She's a devil in disguise, in disguise. I remember them setting up, doing this little showcase, and then it's over and the sort of polite applause, and then they have to carry their own equipment off stage and into a truck, you know, and it was in their nudie suits. It was just sort of funny. The most memorable Burritos show I saw was at the Whiskey, and uh, Graham was doing uh, She Once Lived Here, a George Jones song. And he was, there's a, the, I guess it's the bridge. I see her face in the cool of the evening. I hear her voice with each breeze loud and clear. Tears are coming down his face singing this thing, and no one was noticing. And for me, it was my peak, peak rock and roll moment. Not sitting on Jimmy Page's amp, you know, not dancing in the Foxy Lady video. That was my peak moment. He was erratic. Uh, I mean, his uh, lifestyle meant that he was very inconsistent. I mean, Graham could be brilliant, very emotive, you know, tear your heart out. Even if he wasn't singing in tune, he could, do, he could still tear your heart out. The thing about Graham was he wanted to make sure that everybody around him that he cared about understood this music, country music. He, it, was a, it was a mission he was on and he would, he would take you into his world. He mentioned some George Jones song, and I said, God, I don't know that song. And he said, well, that's George Jones. And I went, who? Just because I ask a friend about her. He had a little portable record player, and one after another, he played us all these albums. George Jones, Merle Haggard, Waylon Jennings, Willie Nelson. We had no idea. We, there, there was no understanding. We, everyone thought country music was lame and for old fogies and people in the South and the Midwest, you know, unhip people. And it was light bulbs, you know, because they were so brilliant. Grand Parsons is the only guy I know that, that could make every chick in the audience weep. <laughs> which is a rare quality. I don't know what it was, but it seemed like the, uh, uh, everybody almost felt sorry for him, you know? But the women really loved him, you know, and loved, loved the way he sang, you know? I remember being in Palomino Club in California and hard and old peroxide waitresses who had been there for yonks, tears streaming down their eyes while they're listening to Grand play. Yeah. Graham continued his friendship with Keith Richards whenever the Stones were in L.A. They introduced him to a new acquaintance who would play a crucial role in Graham's life. I was working for the Rolling Stones uh, in Los Angeles. They were doing, uh, mi they were mixing Beggar's Banquet. And that's how I got to know him. One of the first things he did was borrow five dollars from me to buy a six pack. And I said, I'm gonna like this guy. I like his, you know, like his style. And then he called me and asked me if I would be his road manager, to which I replied, What's a road manager? And uh, now I know. We took our first tour to promote the Gilded Palace of Sin, and we took the train. And that was another one of Graham's ideas. Let's give him credit for that one. Graham was a big uh, train fan. The guys at the band were a little hesitant about flying. Uh, maybe, I think it was probably a lame excuse because they wanted to take the train. Interesting idea, quite uh, expensive, but a lot of fun. That was that famous train tour. That was something else. And it was a hell of a trip, I'll just tell you that. 
lots of poker playing on that train, lots of mischief. Had those brand new nudie suits hanging up in the closet. Today. My job was primarily to get them on the train, hide the drugs, uh, get them fed, uh, get them to rehearse a little bit, and then hide the drugs. And there was a lot of card playing, a lot of cheating, a lot of drinking, a lot of me hiding the drugs, them trying to find the drugs. Graham had like uh, 200 placidils or some kind of pill and some kind of cough syrup that was the strongest thing. I mean, I, it was unbelievable. And he had this little bottle, and he said, let's do some mescaline. It was like, uh, I don't know how heavy, it, but it was, but it was, you take a swallow of the cough syrup and boom, you're out, you know, so. So, everybody took psychedelics on this train. And we were totally crazy. And destiny. Michael Vossi was the representative of AM Records on the train tour. And Michael was more stoned than anybody. The dining car was open. And of course, we were voraciously hungry. And so we went into the dining car, and that could have been the explosive situation that could have queered the whole deal. Because we were definitely not fit to be with regular people and regular people were sitting in that car. They took one look at us at the train and they decided that it'd be better if we had our own apartments because they didn't, the way we were dressed for the late 60s was not conducive to uh, the Amtrak's uh, idea of what people should dress like on a train. Some guy in the dining car, to this day I think he's a brilliant tactician, came up to all of us and said, I know you gentlemen are in show business and you don't want to be bothered by people who want your autographs. I've got a private dining room for you. <laughs> and moved us all into this little place where nobody could see or hear us. And it worked. You know, everybody bought into the, you know, yeah, yeah, we're stars, but, but we also kind of deep down inside knew exactly what was going on, which is keep these crazies away from everybody else. That was kind of wild. We barely got through it. A lot of drinking. A lot of drinking. It was like a Fellini movie. It was like a cowboy Fellini movie travelogue. I did have a sense that we were kind of in this timeless place at that point. And I wasn't high. That's the moment at which in my life I, I just came to the conclusion that this band is really so emblematic of what's good about America. It was pretty much, you know, just chaos. They had a lot of dollars and no sense. They, they just thought if they were at the party, and, and I think the music suffered for it eventually when we plugged in at our, at our first gig and found out that, you know, we were in deep doo-doo because uh, everybody, they weren't, prefer they weren't prepared. The train tour ended, uh, I think it was pretty much a train wreck. I think we flew home because I remember Graham and Michael Clark and Chris Etheridge, I got them on the plane and I had to order three wheelchairs uh, for in LA when we landed for the, the boys who were, you know, air, air sick. Airhead would be more like it and everybody, you know, pissed off and not talking to each other. And those that could still talk. I'm sure there's some other memories on this particular train tour that uh, I might have forgotten, but uh, I remember leaving and I remember getting there. <laughs> As a footnote, though, we had the uh, opportunity at the time to go play Woodstock, and we choose to take the train tour instead. Probably not a great career move for the Flying Burrito Brothers. The train tour was not a financial success, and the burritos weren't selling records either. But that didn't bother Graham too much because of the money he received from his mother's estate. That trust fund was his last permanent connection with his family. That was both freeing, and yet on the other hand, it meant he didn't have to struggle financially in terms of music the way some of the guys that he was playing with. I just saw him from behind. Oh, he was very charming and adorable and 
funny and sweet. We were very, very close right from the beginning. It's one of those love at first sight kind of things. It doesn't usually happen, but it did for us. At that point, I think he and Chris and some of the boys were already having problems. And um, I don't know what they were. And I think that it's been said. When Chris Etheridge left the burritos for whatever reason, then they were trying to figure out what to do, I guess. And Hillman switched back to base, which he'd done with the birds. So then they thought, well, let's get somebody else. Well, Burrito Deluxe album, when we started that, so that's when Graham was starting to get nervous there, and he was ready to get moving. And Graham was spending a lot more time around uh, uh, the Stones whenever they'd come into town. In Gold Coast, slave, Japan, field, sold in the market down in New Orleans. And Graham was starting to wear some pretty interesting stuff on stage. He'd have a scarf, and he'd have a, one of his girlfriend's shirts on. And I used to say, this guy's starting to look like a cross between Dottie West and Mick Jagger here. And he's dancing around. Now, what happened to my buddy here? He's gone. <laughs> I'm losing him. Chris was trying to keep everything together. He was kind of the stalwart guy holding it together. And he saw Graham as this flighty character at that point. He and Chris were sort of disintegrating a little bit at that point because of the Keith influence. I love this picture. Um, you can see how young they were. Childhood and how happy they were. I always figured, you know, hey, this is about the same. He's a little younger than me. And, uh, I always figured, oh, he'll, you know, he'll be around for ages. We can do loads of stuff. I mean, it's like, hey, we were only really just getting going. Um, they were just like two brothers being crazy together. Wild horses. Graham was so proud of the Stones giving him that song to do. Because that was unusual. The Stones didn't just give songs to people. Wild Horses I'd already written before I'd met Graham because he he says, is it all right if I cut it and we hurt? Yeah. The one thing I remember about trying to write the songs for Burrito Deluxe is that the songs weren't coming, you know? And mainly, Parsons was not really writing. He was in a real dry spell. And so they were sitting around the lot. They had to go to do another record, but they didn't have any creative juices. We sort of lost that, that magic we had on Gilded Palace towards his last days in the burritos. He would be going to these gigs we'd do in a limousine. I mean, these are $500 a night shows. We'd be piling in the car with our gear and Graham would show up in a limousine. Graham came from a very wealthy family and had this ongoing trust fund, you know, which was about $55,000 a year. And it's sort of like he had sort of been seduced by all of that without quite earning it yet. <laughs> 38 not KFRC, this is Frank Terry, and let me repeat, the Rolling Stones free concert is going to be on tomorrow at the Altamont Speedway. Apparently, it's one of the most difficult things in the world to give a free concert. As you all know, first, the concert was originally scheduled. You know, it wasn't so much that we were trying to push the burritos. They had the very, you know, good audience of their own, and, uh, but it seemed to be an appropriate place on the surface of it to put, put a lot of different kinds of bands together. The Hells Angels were employed as security guards at Altamont with famously tragic consequences. It was just total chaos, already weird, scattered vibe and violence happening. So at some point, we, the burritos got up and played and we played our sort of da-da-da-da-da, you know, sort of happier country music and everybody got chilled out. It was great. Well, I think they were probably the opening act, and they, they sounded pretty good, you know, and I was real proud of them, like hometown boy makes good. So, you know, it was clear people were having a good time, it was good vibes, and I didn't 
experience anything strange around the stage while we played. Graham up there, and uh, uh, I mean, he's a very gentle guy, a good, very soothing uh, effect on people. And he knew it. <laughs> but uh, I think, I mean, that was probably uh, saved at least some other people's and other heads getting broken. For the for the while, you know, they they left them alone, you know. And uh, Graham can do that. He had a very commanding presence. And then things started to degenerate. You know, the Hell's Angels jumped up on the stage. There was down in the back of the stage, there were there were uh, people from the audience that were getting punched out and, and into fights and everything else, and it just turned into a massive chaos. You know, I, I mean, I just thought, you know, this is going, this is not going well. After the burritos played, Hillman and Sneaky, they left walking. They walked out. Graham and myself and Michael Clark stayed. And we stayed. We, we spent a lot of time with the Stones in that little dinky trailer, uh, which was sort of silly. It was just smoke filled. After the Stones played, Graham ran off with them and got on the helicopter and then Michael and I were the only burritos left. When it was over, we weren't invited. You know? So Graham is in, you know, just gets in the rush with all the followers on and the, you know, the road crew, and they just rush him off to the helicopter. And then Michael and I are like, typical, <laughs> you know, let's fend for ourselves, you know. I guess the combination of the, you know, this, this whole lifestyle and the kind of image these guys had, which, was, which appealed to Graham. I would say that he was impressed by what could be done and saw possibilities that he hadn't thought of himself, and I'd say that he was developing it along there. I never saw him starstruck. Graham was spending more time with the Rolling Stones than he was with his own career. In fact, uh, Keith Richards at one time mentioned to him, he said, like, shouldn't you be at rehearsal? And he said, oh, it's all right, you know, they, they can rehearse around me. Not, not really a good, good idea. He was showing up late, he was, he was not in the greatest shape, and I had to track him down to a stone session. I went in the studio and said, guys, I hate to bother you, I got a show tonight, where's Graham? He's over in the corner. And I go over there, I said, come on, we got a show. He says, oh. Hillman took it personally, and rightfully so, because Graham was, you know, wasn't holding up his end of the, of the deal for the group. Mick Jagger, the other professional in this business, comes over to him and says, Graham, you have a responsibility. You have a show to do tonight. Chris is here. Go with Chris. We're working. Anyway, uh, I drag him out in the car and we go. It was just falling apart anyway. And one day, you know, one day, the band just about had it with Graham Parsons at a club. And a fight took place. And and Graham shows up right two minutes before our, our showtime, uh, not in good shape, drunk and stoned. And we start the first song, which was a fast shuffle. And Graham comes in and starts singing a ballad. I mean, he was famous for that. We'd start a song in one key and one tempo, and he'd start singing a song in another key in three quarter time. It was like the Keystone Cops crashing into the wall. I mean, we had to, oh my God, he's in a bath. Stop, and we had to, and Mike keeps the time of going on the cymbal. We slow way down, and here's Graham. He's like this slow motion. Uh, and I'm going, that's it. Chris Hillman put his fist through Graham Parsons' guitar body. And <laughs> Graham said, why'd you do that, Chris? And I'm steaming, and it's steam coming out of my ears. And so after the first set, we let him go. Hillman just said, Graham, you're fired. And Graham was like, you can't fire me. You know, I'm Graham. And Hillman said, well, you're fired. Goodbye. I thought that Graham was happy that it happened. And that released him from the Flying Burrito Brothers. Graham, in fact, asked me to go to France with him to hang out with the Stones. And I was like, well, but see, Graham had a trust fund and I didn't. After he got fired from the burritos, Graham and his girlfriend Gretchen took a trip to Europe, 
and spent some time at Keith Richards' house in the south of France while the Rolling Stones recorded their new album, Exile on Main Street. We were invited by Keith and Anita to come, come down and um, just hang out. It was like a big feast with uh, the, the children, the animals, the friends, the music, and of course, the drugs were around. So when Graham came down, they were kind of uh, uh, playing and singing together all day long. And uh, it was like the, the Everly Brothers revisited, you know. There we are, you know. Uh, show me that the... Show me that Everly Brothers song I don't know. Yeah, and uh, tell me some more about Lefty Frizzell or the difference between Bakersfield and Nashville. And, uh, yeah. Well, it was some kind of a terrible couple, you know. Uh, when they were together, you, you could not get into their game or uh, you had to just to watch and to listen. You know, I think Graham and Keith played together as much as he played on the record. I don't know, it was really like they were making two records at, at one time, only one wasn't being recorded. He was living in the house, we're sitting around playing all day. He's, we were, I'm writing two songs a day, and we record them in the evening. Yeah, in the background, you know, always, um, he was very intimately involved in it, let's put it that way, yeah. When you are around those uh, very famous people, um, you ask yourself sometimes, well, I'd love to be as popular uh, as they are. I think hanging around the stones and seeing that, that that kind of impact can have on an audience was definitely, you know, he was soaking it up. And he would be asking me about, you know, rock and roll. And so it was a kind of two-way street. All the things they could do together were done. And it ended exactly the same way as it started, like a strike. It was difficult, it was tense, you know, just being around the Rolling Stones is is huge, you know, there's the, the pressure, the, and the insanity of it all. Maybe Keith decided that it was time for Graham to get on with his own work. It's always uh, very difficult to get away from uh, a guy like Keith, you know, but you cannot just hang around people like the Rolling Stones all your life. Still in touch, but I don't think I saw him. I can't remember seeing him after that. It was just like, well, you know, I'm seeing a few weeks, or so give us a call. Uh, it was one of those things. But uh, I knew that he was once again, you know, cleaning up, and he wanted to get out of the dope thing. And uh, and I knew he loved Joshua Tree, so we knew he was there. And then we, you know, we said, well, let him do his thing, you know. And that was basically that's where it tailed out. You know? I'm very glad I didn't go because. He got into heroin. And had I gone, I certainly would, have, would not have ended up in the Eagles. You know? Take it easy, take it easy. Country rock became one of the most commercially successful musical genres of the 1970s, during the time when Bernie Ledden performed with the Eagles. Yeah, I think there was some influence of Graham specifically on the Eagles. The four albums that I played on with the Eagles sort of over that range explored a lot of the same ground that Graham had explored. Was a thousand dollar wedding. Well, he called me up and asked me if I would come and perform his wedding. The other day. When Graham got married to Gretchen, they came to New Orleans. My dad was the only parental figure in Graham's life. Um, his mother had died. His father um, committed suicide when he was very young. It was odd that at this wedding, it was mostly friends of my parents. I found the whole group at his wedding, to be honest with you, scary. 
I found the phrase um, sort of psychic vampires going through my head. I felt that a lot of these people were people who were just drawing off things. He was dressed a little oddly for, the, for most of the guests. He was kind of disengaged. He always had that kind of disengaged attitude. I'm not sure why even he decided to have the wedding at his stepfather's house in New Orleans, because they did not get along very well. It was a father saying one road for his son and, and you know, Graham wanting to take a different road. Back in LA, Graham and Gretchen moved to the exclusive Chateau Marmont Hotel, while Graham started work on his solo career. Well, we were doing Graham's first album, GP. He was living here with his wife. It's a little oasis right in the middle of, of the Sunset Strip in Hollywood. Graham wrote music here in, in, uh, in the room. And he also, at, at, occasionally, he'd sneak down the hall where they had a grand piano. And he could be heard at, in the evenings sometimes tinkling, writing, or just, it was his, his refuge. And, and it was very, a very comforting place for him. My involvement is I'm sitting home one day and the telephone rings and it's Graham Parsons, who I hadn't seen in a year or even heard about. He said, do you think there's a deal here in town for me? I get a call from Graham. He said, I got a deal. Ed Tickner, his manager, uh, got him a deal with Warner Brothers. And he said, we're going in the studio. And he was so excited. And I said, well, great. Let's do it, you know? Graham was looking for a female singer to sing with him because on, on the lines of George Jones and Tammy Wynette, he hit the, the, lot, the lottery jackpot when it, when it came to finding Emmy Lou. That, I mean, it's actually Chris Hillman who told him about Emmy Lou. I said, there's a young lady up in Georgetown. You need to call her up and talk to her. She's great. And uh, I had to convince him, I had to twist his arm to make that phone call, but he did. He called her from my room. So that when he called me up, you know, and said, I, this is Graham Parsons, I kind of went, and he had to kind of tell me who he was. He came down and uh, sat in with me and said, I'll call you, and I didn't really think he would. I got a ticket in the mail, and I just went out there. I had no idea. I didn't know what to expect. Um, didn't know what was going to happen. Graham gathered the hottest team of studio players for the recording sessions, mainly from his childhood hero Elvis Presley's band in Las Vegas. The songs were good, great songs, and um, we just got a chance to really open up and just be ourselves. They had laid down these great tracks, and Graham was unable to sing. He was drunk, he was slurring his words. Graham was drinking a lot doing that recording, and so I, there were times when, uh, he, you know, he was together and times when he wasn't. I hadn't done that much recording in my life, but I thought, I, I did, if this is the way people make records, I didn't, I just, I don't get this. And I actually didn't believe that record was gonna come out. Eddie said, we can't continue like this. It's gonna be an embarrassment to you. You're blowing, you're blowing your big chance here, kid. And uh, Graham kind of saw the handwriting on the wall, or on the bottle, if you will. And he did, he, he, he pulled himself together. Didn't become totally sober, mind you, but he cut down and uh, we did the, or he did, we did the celebrating after the sessions not before. I just thought, well, I got my $500 and I went home and bought a guitar with it. <laughs> so record one got done. That's all it took, the mention of your I know he called me, he was very excited about the album because he thought it was, you know, sort of just exactly what he had hoped to do and the kind of thing he wanted to do. And then a few months later, uh, I get a copy of this record uh, in the mail and asking me if I want to go on the road. And I thought, why not? <laughs> Graham called a few old friends who called a few friends and, and put the Fallen Angels band together. Ah, oh, the Fallen Angels tour. Boy, they named that tour right. Uh, everything fell apart. The, we, it started rehearsing in my home in, uh, in Van Nuys, California, on Chandler Boulevard. So I went out there and we had the most disorganized rehearsals. It was like we never worked up a single song. I mean, we would play them, but there would never be a beginning or a middle or an end. It's just like party time most of the time. 
We weren't serious enough about the rehearsals. It was just wild. Everyone, everyone was playing music and having a good time, but we weren't taking care of business. And I'd never worked with a band before, so I thought there was some magical process by which people got on stage, and, and it all magically came together. I, I just, I, I'd never been around people like this. Uh, we had a big party, Warner Brothers had a big party for us to go on the tour. We had a tour bus, uh, the worst tour bus ever, ever. I think it was an old converted Greyhound bus and they had painted it maroon. It had this huge eagle in front and it said Graham Parsons and the Fallen Angels on the side. Graham brought along Gretchen and we left my house and uh, went on our tour and the tour was just disaster after disaster. And we did our first gig and we got fired because we couldn't even play one song from beginning to end. Meanwhile, I was just trying to learn my parts and running a tape recorder so that I could get my little bit so I could learn my harmony part, at least on the songs from the record that we were going to do. I must say that Emmy Lou's a pushy chick. I mean, she made, she made them all work. He needed a keeper, and she, you know, and she did. She, she took care of him. She just made them do it again and again and again and again. She was like a band leader. And we're going to work up a beginning and an ending and a solo. <laughs> and we had a rehearsal. And the next show, we got so many encores that we had to come back and start playing the show over again because we, we didn't have enough material. Well, I did my best to bring her back to what she used to be. And I soon learned. I saw it at Liberty Hall. I remember almost everything about that show. Um, Graham was singing pretty well, and Emmy was singing great, and, and it was uh, it was probably the beginning of my interest in a lot of country music that I had missed. For the first time, I really heard Graham's voice. I really heard it, and I don't know how to explain it any other way. And I, I, I just fell in love with his singing at that point. I realized I was, I was a part of something that was pretty extraordinary, but I also realized how extraordinary he was. And when Graham was together, there was just nothing like it. his presence on stage. He had this extraordinary command, this amazing charisma. And you just felt like you, all you had to do was just get up there and sing with him. You just knew that everything was gonna be right. Um, and that was like this amazing turning point for me and I think for him. I never asked them about, you know, their personal relationship, and there are all kinds of talk about that that I've heard, but I know that musically, they just were soulmates. He had an extraordinary effect on me, and I will always love him. You know, he'll always be this, this dear, dear soul in my life that touched me so deeply. I got the feeling that Gretchen was having a hard time dealing with Graham and the band. I sort of worried about their relationship early on. But this thing between Emmy and Graham musically was so intense, and the band was so tight as a group at that point. And here's Gretchen, sort of ta like me, tagging along, but with no real claim on them. I mean, Gretchen has a husband there. I didn't, so it didn't affect me the same way psychologically. After the Fallen Angels tour, Graham and Gretchen went to the Caribbean for a sailing trip with Bob Parsons and Graham's little sister, Diane. It turned out to be a disaster. Graham and Bob fell out over the newly wedded couple's lifestyle and, some say, over an old family rumor. We were cruising the West Indies and we took a trip over um, Easter break. It was in the spring. More fighting that kind of went on between Bob and Graham and Gretchen at that point. I think basically he was an evil man and Graham loved him um, until he really kind of found out that he was sort of involved in his mother's death. 
my dad was an alcoholic. I think it's pretty well documented that Avis was an alcoholic. And when Avis was in the hospital, it is reported that my father brought her alcohol and brought her the drink that caused her death. And Graham and Gretchen left um, the vacation early. I didn't know why until later that it was because my father kicked them off the boat. Um, and it was basically because he didn't want the influence of what they were doing, which was drugs, um, with me on the boat. And so he had them leave. I don't think that Graham believed for a minute that, that Bob did anything to harm Avis. In discussing this with other family members, I wouldn't, I would never say that my father didn't bring her alcohol in the hospital, but I feel if he did, it was because she demanded it. And in the similar way that someone who's in a hospital dying of lung cancer will have their family sneak cigarettes into the hospital. I don't know what happened. The man that raised me, I don't think killed his wife, so. After his break with Bob, and Graham was never the same. He just was not the same. His, his joy was gone. And that was the last time I saw Graham. If shattered's the right word or not, I think it was um, definitely strained after that point. I truly, um, I mean, there was phone conversations with Graham after that but um, we didn't see him again. He was on a pretty much of a destructive path by then. You know, it was really sad to see. And nothing I could do changed it. I tried, but really wasn't much I could do. into Phil's house because he was having problems with Gretchen, his wife. Phil kept an eye on him. So Graham stayed at my house, which was uh, a fenced uh, uh, bastion with, with Great Danes running in the yard. You guys know who Phil Kaufman is, was, is. I don't think people change their spots so quickly. It wasn't a good place to be, especially for Graham really bad, bad place to be surrounded by those people. He needed badly someone to talk to, you know, and I, I just thought, well, I'm it. Margaret Fisher had known Graham from his days at Bowles School in Florida. She befriended him again after his separation from Gretchen. He'd talk about what it was like growing up in Waycross, and you know, he'd talk about this and that. It became somewhat more than that, you know? It became, yes, somewhat more than that. He loved it out there. That was a kind of spiritual place for him, I think. It meant something to him, and it was, it was a very beautiful place. It seemed to be a place he went to refuge. Graham kept up a love for the place. There's just this vastness, and it's so quiet. It's like being on another planet. It was oftentimes he would sort of escape to there. Unfortunately, he escaped too far the last time, I guess. But. Phil and Graham heard from, from Joshua Tree that Clarence White got killed in an automobile accident. Clarence was the uh, great guitar player with the birds. Clarence was killed by a drunk driver after a show loading his equipment out. The greatest guitar player I've ever heard in my entire, entire life, without a doubt. Clarence White came out of the bluegrass scene to become one of the most innovative guitar players of his era while playing with the birds. His playing style was discussed by musicians on the same level as that of Jimi Hendrix. 
Graham had long been impressed by White's talent and by his down-to-earth personality. Graham and I went to his funeral, and we thought that Clarence would not have chosen that few type of funeral if he had his choice. I remember at the graveside, Graham started singing further along, and some other people joined in. We were standing there, and I remember Graham told Phil, and Bernie Ladin were standing there, and they just sang a song. And uh, they were standing there, and Graham said, well, if this ever happens to me, don't let them do this to me. Graham decided that we didn't want that to happen to us. If anything should happen to us, that we would like to be taken out here to the peace and quiet of the Joshua Tree Desert. I guess he was just using it as a figure of speech, but that was his last wishes. You know. It was uh, whoever thought, you know, that it would happen. Won't you scratch my itch, sweet Annie After Clarence White's funeral, Graham went back to work on his second solo album, Grievous Angel, which would ultimately be hailed as his masterpiece. He checked into Capitol Records studios and used the same musicians who'd played on the GP album. These guys don't only usually play for like Elvis or George Jones, you know what I mean? But they'd play for him. He would sing a little bit and, and he would ask everybody, uh, how does it feel? I mean, everybody had a good communication with him and he was really relaxed. The music was, was excellent. He had a good selection of songs and he had written some and, and he had uh, it co-written co some songs and it was going, it was going very well. Before then, I had been kind of intrigued by what we were doing, and, and I loved the fact that I, I seemed to be pretty good at it, but it was more about me. And uh, at that moment, it became about him, and it became about the music and what we did together. It's not how many, how tricky your chords could be, but how much passion you put into, into your music. And you could hear passion. Well, with, with the Grievous Angel over uh, the the uh, the album, uh, Graham was very excited. He was getting ready. His career was on the move. The record company was happy with it, and uh, they were we were going to getting ready for the tour. And Graham was going to go off to the desert, and that you know then we all know what happened after that. And lots of times he didn't seem to be having a good time, and perhaps some of the drug use has to do with. I think an underlying un unhappiness and uh, inability to connect with people very much in certain ways. Looking back on it, I think it was just a, you know, an up and down thing with him. He was addicted to drugs, he was addicted to pills, he was addicted, period. He was gonna go out to Joshua Tree and dry out. This is really it. I said, this is it. You know, we've gotta get rid of these people, you know. Um, you know, we have a life to look forward to, and um, he promised me and um, that he, that's what he was going out the desert to do. My impression is that he also had, his life had calmed down considerably at that point. And, you know, this thing at, out in Joshua Tree is just really tragic. If there is one day in my life I could take back, it would be that day. We let him go down to Joshua Tree with a friend of his, Margaret, and um, Dale and her boyfriend, Michael Martin. Well, I mean, you just drove down this two-lane road, and finally there was like this little motel off to the side, and that was it. I mean, it just um, could have been any place. Then I heard him tell he had come up here to celebrate the, the completion of his, his new album, Grievous Angel. Came up with a couple of friends. They were drinking and doing naughty things. He sort of slid back. Backsliding is what we call it. <laughs> when you're a Southern Baptist, if you backslide into sin, you know, but he transgressed once too many times. You know, to, 
To see the light go out in somebody's eyes. Well, that, that, that's not something I think belongs to be shared, <laughs> if you understand. He made that one fatal lapse. Uh, it's such a silly way to go. I know he knows it. You know, the bottom line is the boy died, and I watched him. You know, and and I'll never get over it. And tell you the truth, it's not something I really think somebody should get over. I saw him in the corners office. I did kiss him goodbye. Because the phone rang at three o'clock in the morning and um, my father was in the hospital. He was in the beginning stages of cirrhosis with the liver. Bonnie was home with me, my stepmother. Um, she was the one who told me she got off the phone and um, told me that he was dead. And um, believe it or not, I think I heard about it on the television, on the news. Nobody even called or thing. My reaction was incredible sadness because, you know, another friend had, and a close friend had died from alcoholism and drug, drug abuse, you know. And, and how sad and, and really, just what a waste, I mean, 26 years old. It's a hard way to find out That trouble is real In a I was sitting in my home in L.A. playing shoulda. You know, I should have been there. I should have, I should have taken care of him. I, I, sh I should have stayed with him. And, and Kathy, my girlfriend, said, you know, why don't you shut up, stop playing shoulda, and go do it or shut up. I actually had a birthday party already planned that happened. Um, and at the same time, a funeral was being planned. My dad was in the hospital, left the hospital um, against doctor's orders. Checked himself out um, and went to California to um, bring Graham home. Which, of course, is the beginning of the Phil Kaufman story that um, people find have found intriguing for years. And then when I called the funeral home to find out where the body was, they said that the family had called and the body was being transported to Los Angeles airport to be shipped home to New Orleans. New Orleans was home. I mean, Graham had no real home. Where else would the family bring him but to New Orleans? I mean, I think that Graham's family became uh, his musician friends, the friends in his, in his world of music, people like Phil, who just, I don't know, just adopted Graham, you know, uh, in so many ways. Bob Parsons. One of the body flown to New Orleans to establish a residency after death so that he could control the Snively estate. And I wasn't gonna have that. Graham wouldn't have that. Graham was still a resident of Florida. And whether Graham was buried in Florida or Texas or California or wherever, you know, you are a resident where you are, you know, legally domiciled. So where Graham was buried had no play on anything. It was here at Los Angeles International Airport in 1973 that I came out with Michael Martin in a borrowed hearse to take our pal Graham Parsons out to Joshua Tree for his final resting place. There was very little security at the time, and, and I sort of imagine that not many people had stolen bodies. 
So when we got to the counter, I told the man that we had to fly the body by private plane at a Van Nuys airport. He bought the story. I signed a hastily Jeremy Nobody. I think what he actually signed was Mickey Mouse, but in his scrawl. He used the name Gerald Nobody, uh, signed, signed the release of the body. He had been drinking, and Michael had been drinking, and I'm sure they smelled like this brewery. Um, but the guy believed him and released the body. You know, who was going to claim Graham? You know, were they going to bury him near Phil Kaufman? You know, like, was someone going to, one of his friends going to choose a resting site for him? You know, it's, it's crazy. Got the body loaded into the back of the hearse, pulled out, and we headed off for Joshua Tree to honor the pact that I had made with Graham. I don't know the details of that other than my father left and was back, came back, and on my birthday, after my birthday party, they told me that his body had been stolen from the airport. They didn't want to ruin my birthday, but they also wanted me to know because they knew it would be in the paper the next day. They drove off, you know, up to the desert, stopping it at uh, the, all the bars along the way, and, you know, and bought a five-gallon can of gasoline. We filled the hearse up with regular and filled the container up with high test. High test was for Graham. We didn't want him to ping. <laughs> that someone would take the body of my big brother that I thought was going to come home and take him and do such a horrible thing to him. Um, you know, I didn't know back then any, any of his wishes or what he wanted. All I knew was that somebody had stolen the body. We're driven from LAX with, with Graham in the back of the hearse. It's about two or three hour drive. We hit Joshua Tree, came up the National Monument, came up here in Joshua Tree, pulled up to right about here. Michael and I got out, we opened up the back of the hearse, and then we went to open the casket. We paid our last respects to him. I poured the five gallons of gasoline in the coffin on Graham, took out a match, said goodbye, Graham. You don't just take a friend and pour gasoline on them and light a match. How do, how do, you, how do you do that? How does anyone with any morals, any heart, begin to make a pact with a friend like that. It's insane. You don't do it. You don't do it. In the first place, it wasn't a proper cremation. It was, it was a partial burning. You know, and then and they left him. I mean, that's what's so stupid. If you're going to cremate somebody, do a bit of research, you know, and, and like do it properly. And but you know, don't like go leave him in the desert by the side of the road, half burned. I mean, that's not very cool. After what happened, um, I I obviously totally blamed him and all the hate and anger that I had um, was placed on him. <laughs> for stealing his body and taking it away and burning it. I've never had second thoughts. And, I, and I, so people ask me if, if I had died, do I think Graham would have honored the wish? Uh, and I believe, yes, he would have. He would have hired someone to do it, but uh, the job would have gotten done. I understood it a little more um, after him explaining that to me. I accepted it. Um, but I also felt like there would have been a better way to handle it than what he had done. And I never communicated to him the pain that he had caused. And that actually to this day, he still causes. And it was over. He was gone, he, he, you know? After I, you know, we sobered up and, and, and did the deed, you know, then, then a realization, you know, he's, oh, he's gone. He's really gone. I mean, we've done this, this, this thing here in the desert. Now I'm home, but, it, you know, that's over. Now you got to get on with your life. And, uh, and I did.
I lived happily ever after. I am living happily ever after. I was a pallbearer at Graham's funeral. When they found the, found the remains, there were about 35 pounds of him left, which Bob claimed and brought back to New Orleans and had him interred in that, that cemetery. The uh, cemetery is off of um, uh, Airline Drive, perfectly normal kind of uh, cemetery environment. Oh, my land is like a wild goose Wanders all around everywhere Trembles and There is so much bad press about Graham's um, graveside. And it rolls the my dad died of cirrhosis of the liver two years later, and my family, my sisters and I, were not ever in a position of um, thinking that we're going to go to Graham's grave and we're going to do a proper monument to it. And I know the story of Phil Kaufman, that Graham wanted to be cremated and his ashes strewn in Joshua Tree. Um, then why would his graveside be such an issue today? People should know his music. That should be his legacy, not the way he died. He didn't touch any of those things that make monster sellers out of your records, but he did have a vision of going somewhere that no one else has gone before. He had a profound respect for the tenets of American culture that gave us country music. I think he understood that. He changed it, and the guy never had a hit record. I wish Graham would have had a chance to live a little longer and record some more. That's, that's what I'll say. Graham's career goal was to die young and become a legend. He'll always be 26. I don't think he had any sense of, of an ending. In fact, on the contrary, I think at that time it was almost like a new beginning because things were going so well. You know, and there, there isn't a better exit than, you know, the early young death while you're still beautiful and then the strange afterlife with the corpse being dragged into the desert. Graham can never die. Like, Graham can never be at peace. It can't rest because people won't let him die. You know, that kind of haunts me. <laughs> How they seem to like to celebrate his life on the anniversary of his death, and I relive it each time I do. And tomorrow we will still be there Tomorrow we may still be here.